My name is Matt Kennard, Head of Investigations at Declassified UK. On May 23rd, 2023, I interviewed Professor Noam Chomsky, the most important public intellectual in the world, with a view that he could write a foreword to my new book, The Racket, A Rogue Reporter vs. The American Empire. We covered a whole range of themes to do with the book, but also his work going back many, many decades. Unfortunately, a few weeks after the interview, he fell very sick. But his words are extremely important and speak to many themes and many issues which are exercising the global population right now. So they need to be heard. So here it is. I hope you enjoy it. Hi, Noam. Thanks for joining me today. Um, thank you. Today, we're going to be mostly talking about my book, The Racket, A Rogue Reporter vs. The American Empire, which was mostly reported while I was at the Financial Times and has reporting from all over the world, from Haiti to Tunisia to Bolivia to Turkey. Um, all our countries and all themes that you've written about for many decades. But firstly, I wanted to ask you, um, you've said previously that the Financial Times is the only major international newspaper that tells the truth. Why do you think that is? Well, the Financial Times is uh, mainly a business press, uh, which means that rather like the Wall Street Journal, it does quite good reporting. Editorial pages are another matter. Though at the Financial Times, they're, I would say, generally more serious than the norm. So uh, it's generally true, I found over the years, that the business press tends to provide less doctrinal, more uh, accurate uh, reporting of affairs that have any relation to the business world. And I think that's understandable. Uh, the business community basically runs the world. They have to understand uh, they can't be too deluded about uh, events of the world and forces at work and so on. But I should say that in the FT, some of the commentators are quite as quite astute. The Financial Times sent me to Haiti the year after the earthquake to cover the so-called reconstruction there. The US had near complete control over the country. Can you describe briefly the uh, US role in Haiti over recent history? Well, we can start. I mean, the whole history is so disgraceful and shameful. It's painful to talk about it since 1804 when Haiti made the mistake of uh, becoming the first free country of free men in the hemisphere and uh, overthrowing slavery. Uh, the world, the so-called civilized world was, had tantrums about it, tried hard to destroy it. The U.S. refused even to recognize Haiti till 1862 recognized Haiti and Liberia as uh, places where you could send freed slaves. Then comes an awful history, which I won't recount. By the 1980s, uh, uh, 90s, the U.S. was still strongly supporting the dictatorships, vicious, brutal dictatorships. There was an election in first free election in the country in 1989, everyone assumed that it would be won by the US-backed candidate, a World Bank official from the elite. Nobody was paying attention to the organizing that was going on in the slums and the hills, which was pretty remarkable. And they managed to win uh, with a overwhelming majority. They managed to elect Jean-Paul Aristide, a populist priest with quite a strong record of courageous opposition to the dictatorship. Well, the States was, of course, infuriated, uh, not going to tolerate this. Um, he uh, had seven months in office and was 
achieving quite remarkable results. He was even impressed. Even the international financial institutions, World Bank, IMF, were quite impressed with the overthrowing of corruption, the positive actions, and so on. Well, he was overthrown in a coup, uh, tacitly backed by the United States, not so secretly. After seven months, they instituted a reign of extreme torture and oppression i actually visited in those years it was i've been in a lot of uh, pretty awful places uh, in around the world but i've never seen such fear and misery as right at, shortly after the sidras coup takeover people were simply they wouldn't even talk to you the most they'd say is there are voices everywhere right? uh, there there are eyes everywhere right can't say anything, uh, and the poverty was uh, indescribable. Well, that lasted through the Clinton years. Uh, finally, in I mean, the there was a very interesting. Uh, the Clinton administration finally agreed to allow Aristide to return. Sent the Marines, restored him, but on condition on can, that he accept very harsh economic programs, which doomed the country to further disaster. He had to let in with no restrictions. U.S. agribusiness produced rice and from Clinton's home state, mostly incidentally. Haitian farmers are quite efficient, but they can't compete with highly subsidized U.S. agribusiness. So that was going to virtually wipe out the basis for peasant society. But it was worse than that. I happened at that time to be following the AP direct news through some system that had been worked out briefly. You watch AP news, it's quite interesting. You're getting direct moment by moment reporting without any filtering, just what the reporters see. In. But every day on the AP News, there's one story selected, featured, says for editors, a break. They say for editors, this is the top story for the day. Well, the day that the Marines were going to land with a lot of hoopla about how wonderful it is, we're liberating Haiti. The top story that day was that the Treasury Department had been permitting Texaco Oil Company to send oil to the Junta. Now, that's very important. There were almost no restrictions on the military Junta. Rich could go to Miami and shop, buy whatever they wanted, no problems. There was one thing they couldn't get, oil. And the CIA was testifying to Congress that all oil shipments had been cut. Just walking around Port-au-Prince, you could see that that's not true. In fact, you could see the Mev's family, the rich family, building uh, oil uh, uh, facilities. So obviously oil was coming in. Well, it turned out that secretly the Clinton administration was applying, was providing oil to the junta, the one thing they couldn't get. Uh, uh, I was writing an article about it, but I barely even mentioned this. I know my article wouldn't come out for six weeks. I thought by then it would be a big story. Well, nothing. It simply wasn't reported. Uh, had to be the story is... U.S. liberating Haiti, not U.S. destroyed Haiti by supporting the military junta. I was able to leak this material to my friend Alex Coburn, who was writing, I think, for the nation at that time, and he did do a story about it, but that's the only thing that appeared. This is particularly interesting to me because of a childhood experience. In the uh, around 19, late 30s, early 40s, I was pretty closely following the 
Spanish Civil War, uh, the official position of the United States and other liberal democracies was neutrality, wouldn't participate. That's a gift to the Axis and to Franco, of course, because Germany and Italy were arming them, sending and, and uh, for the liberal democracies to say neutrality is to say, okay, we'll let them be destroyed. There was one thing that Germany and Italy couldn't supply, oil. The, in the left-wing press that I was reading at the time, they reported that the Treasury Department had allowed the Texaco Oil Company to break its contracts with the Republic and to ship oil to Franco. Uh, the government, of course, denied this. Later, it turned out to, that they, they conceded that quietly that it was true. Same oil company. Then uh, history replayed in an unbelievably ugly way. Well, then come the following years, uh, uh, I won't go through the details. It was impossible for Haiti to reconstruct under the harsh conditions that Clinton imposed. Clinton, in fact, later apologized for them. Finally, uh, there was another election. Our state was elected again. U.S., Canada, and France basically invaded Haiti, kidnapped him, sent him off to the Central African Republic, uh, shut him up, uh, restored the government to brutal thugs. His party, Lavalas Man Party, wasn't even allowed to participate. Well, that's the way it continues until now. By now, the country is such a hideous wreck. It's hard enough. It can even be reconstructed. Maybe its best bet would be to have China invest in it. And that's not a joke, incidentally. Uh, it's 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 a history of centuries of vicious, murderous torture and violence, mainly not for secret reasons. Black men overthrew slavery, became a free country of black men, not women. Uh, that was just intolerable, especially to the slave society next door. France is an even worse. France, which had... Uh, Haiti had been a French colony, the richest colony in the French Empire. Large part of France's wealth derives from Haiti. Uh, they imposed a severe indemnity on Haiti to punish them for daring to overthrow uh, slavery. Haiti had no choice, had to pay under these conditions of imperial uh, attack. It wasn't until, I don't, I think the 1940s that Haiti actually managed to pay off the France. Aristide, when he was president, politely requested the French to uh, consider remunerating Haiti for this immense burden that had strangled the country after horrible French colonialism and slavery. French France did establish a commission to look at, into it, headed by Regis de Bray, leftist Regis de Bray. They decided that France had no obligations. I mean, all of this it gets so unspeakable. You can't you can't even say can't even talk about it. Everywhere you look, it's beyond description. The post Second World War economic and political settlement was said by many to have had an idealistic thread originally that was later subverted. Do you agree with this? There was an idealistic thread in the 40s. It shows up most strikingly in the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights. It was actually initiated by the United States. Eleanor Roosevelt was the leading figure pushing it, but it had very broad participation, uh, direct participation in many parts of the world. So it was a joint declaration of 
all, the, pretty much the whole world as could be brought together. And it's a pretty forthcoming document, especially if you look at the socioeconomic rights, Article 25. Uh, I mean, it calls for things that we ought to take for granted, but that don't exist. Every person should have the right to a decent job, to health care, uh, to uh, whatever makes life feasible. There should be special provision for women, for mothers after birth. Must be, have, they must be cared for. Uh, their children must be cared for. Uh, well, that was an idea. That was still the effect of the New Deal spirit, which had some effects. But overall, there was almost nothing idealistic. Uh, starting in the toward the end of the war, in the late late forty uh, four or forty five, uh, there was a wave of radical democracy that was spreading over the world. Uh, the depression was over, maybe the war was coming to an end, uh, Russia was defeating the Nazis, uh, Japanese imperialism had been turned back. There was a, a lot of hope that maybe we can move to a new world, which will be really just and honorable. The US wasn't having that. When the, the US troops first entered Italy, that's where the entered the continent first in 1944, U.S. and British troops. Italy had been pretty much liberated by the um, resistance, the partisans. Uh, they had begun to establish a uh, worker-based, worker-owned economy, especially in northern Italy. Uh, the U.S. and Britain dismantled it, restored the old regime, uh, including the, the king who had supported the Nazis, uh, Victor Manuel, imposed uh, um, um, the, um, what's his name, it escapes me, the Bedolio, the field marshal, who had been responsible for the Ethiopia invasion. He was put in, fascist collaborators restored, uh, the old order was restored. Same in Greece, there was an uprising in Greece. British weren't strong enough to control it. Americans moved in. Maybe 150,000 people or so were killed. Uh, finally, uh, Stalin wasn't supporting the guerrillas. He was living up to the Yalta Agreement, which put this in the British-American zone. And uh, they were decimated. And uh, Gr Greece was restored to a quasi-fascist order. That's uh, pretty much the same happened in Western Europe. Uh, the old order was reconstituted, plenty of Nazi collaborators, uh, some interesting. Same thing was happening in Japan. That's, uh, um, that's uh, in 1945, February 1945, the U.S. was basically taking over world governance from Britain. Britain had been the former global hegemon, and the U.S. was pushing them aside and taking over. The first place to be concerned with was Latin America. That's our territory. So the in February 45, the United States called a hemispheric conference in Latin America, where it imposed an economic charter for the Americas, which was opposed to economic nationalism in all its forms. There's a background. The State Department was deeply concerned with what they called, the, I'm virtually quoting now, the philosophy of the new nationalism, which calls for an equitable distribution of resources for the population and insists that the first beneficiaries of a country's resources should be the people of that country. None of that. The first beneficiaries are foreign investors. That was the economic charter for the Americas. So Brazil was allowed to produce steel, but 
low level steel that didn't compete with uh, high quality US steel and so on. That's the back, that's 45. The Bretton Woods institutions in uh, 44, right before that, had, were kind of a mixture. They did establish a system in which the US would be able to basically have uh, free economic penetration and essentially substantial political control over most of the world. But on the other hand, they did establish a, an order, an economic order, which did lay the basis for uh, 20, 25 years of uh, quite s substantial growth. In France, it's called the Conclorieuse, the 30 glorious years. In the United States, economists call it the golden age of the American economy fastest growth rate, egalitarian growth rate, uh, New Deal provisions were still in force. There was a business offensive already building up to try to break it down, but the business offensive didn't really succeed until the late 70s and the onset of the neoliberal period uh, during the, which just totally reversed it all, was basically bitter class war, you know, uh, go into the details, but by international standards, which are not very elevated, the Bretton Woods system was moderately uh, decent. But the things like, I just talk about the UD, Universal Declaration again, through the subsequent period, it was at least honored in words. By the time you get to the <coughs> neoliberal years, then I pretend. So Jean Kirkpatrick, uh, Reagan's UN ambassador, dismissed the Universal Declaration as what she called a letter to Santa Claus. She was talking about the socioeconomic provisions. And it's just a letter to Santa Claus. Nobody can pay attention to this nonsense. The um, Human Rights Director for the Reagan and Bush administration, Paula Dobriansky, said, these things are a myth. We have to destroy the myth that people have socioeconomic rights. None of this universal declaration business. Um, Morris Abram, who was the delegate to the UN Commission on Human Rights, vetoed, he was the sole veto of the UN resolution on right to development, basically Article 25. He said, this is pernicious, uh, destructive, it's a dangerous perversion, we have to stop all of this. So by the time you get to neoliberalism, which was basically class war, uh, even in a pretense of verbal pretense of honoring these provisions was gone. Uh, there, And that's part of the history of the post-war period. During the early years, there was some remnant of the social democratic New Deal policies, the aspirations for more justice and freedom, but they were under sharp attack, which finally succeeded, and you get into the neoliberal period. Uh, the Bretton Woods institutions were pretty much undermined by Nixon when he took the country off the gold standard. My book, The Racket, looks at many of the myths that the US uses to project its power around the world. One of the main ones is that it practices and promotes free trade. Is this true? Of course not. Take a look at the World Trade Organization. It's called, that's the centerpiece of what's called free trade. It's one of the most highly protectionist trade agreements in history. What are called intellectual property rights are exorbitant patent restrictions of a kind which had never existed before. If they had existed in the 19th century, the United States would still be exporting uh, fur and, and uh, agricultural products. No country could possibly develop under those restrictions, which gave enormous 
patent rights, uh, long 20 year rights, not just process patents, but even product, uh, not just product, but also process patents, meaning others can't figure out better ways to make the same, uh, same uh, uh, product. Uh, that's why pharmaceutical prices are astronomical, way beyond the cost of production, even though a lot of the production is based on government, uh, uh, government uh, research and government funded and government developed research. Uh, it, in fact, they're just investor rights agreements and could go through the details. There's, um, um, and in fact, it's kind of interesting to see how the U.S. treats the World Trade Organization. So, um, as you know, the world is strongly opposed to uh, U.S. sanctions, almost all of them. The During the Clinton years, the sanctions on Cuba, which are utterly outrageous, and the whole world, is literally the whole world is opposed to them. You look at the votes at the United Nations, it's... Uh, 184 to two against the sanctions, U.S. and Israel. Uh, 1996, Clinton sharply stepped up the sanctions, the helms burton Act. Europe, which is very much opposed to the sanctions, brought the question to the World Trade Organization, asked the World Trade Organization, remember that U.S. sanctions are third party sanctions. Everybody has to obey them or else you're punished severely. So everybody hates them, but everyone obeys them. Uh, Europe brought it to the World Trade Organization to ask for a judgment on the legality of the uh, sanctions. Clinton administration was outraged. They condemned the World Trade Organization, pulled out of the negotiations. Stuart Eisenstadt, who was Secretary of Commerce, wrote that... Uh, the World Trade Organization has no bit interfering in internal U.S. policy, which has been designed for 30 years to overthrow the government of Cuba. And they have no right to interfere with this. That's how the U.S., of course, the case was dropped. The U.S. pulls out its drop. And so the U.S. treats the World Trade Organization. So it's not a free, that's the main I mean, if you look at NAFTA, it's about the same, you know, similar things. The Racket has a chapter on the key role played by the US in Turkey's war on the Kurds and Israel's war on the Palestinians. Can you describe what the US role is in both those conflicts? Yes, I've been in both places. I visited Diyarbakir shortly after the worst, just at the period when the worst terror of the 1990s under the Clinton administration was subsiding, so you could at least travel around a little. The 90s, were, I mean, Tur Tur the curves of an awful history of oppression, I won't run through the whole story. Uh, the largest Kurdish part of the Kurdish populations in Turkey, where they've been bitterly oppressed. The oppression picked up strongly in the 1990s, Clinton years. Uh, Clinton provided the arms for it. As the terror mounted against, the, first of all, the, the terror against the Kurdish population was very serious. Tens of thousands of people were killed. Uh, thousands of villages were, towns were just wiped out. Uh, hundreds of thousands of people were driven into the slums and the miserable living conditions in Istanbul. I, maybe you did. I visited the places where they live. It's indescribable. Uh, as the atrocities mounted, U.S. aid mounted. By 1997, 98, when the atrocities peaked, the United States, the Clinton administration, was providing about 80% of the aid. Clinton spent, provided, I think in one year, 1998, he provided more aid to the Turkish military than the entire Coast War, Cold War period combined up to the onset of the insurgency. Press refused to report it. New York Times had a bureau in Ankara, of course. Check and see. Almost not a word. Uh, it was certainly possible to find out. No secret about it. 
was real murderous terror. It declined a little in the early years of the this century, then picked up again in around 2005 when uh, Erdogan took over, began to increase the repression. Now it's pretty bad again, not like the 90s, but bad. And now it's extending to uh, the Syrian areas where the Kurds had established a pretty free society in the midst of the calamity of the Syrian war, but Turkey's attacking it. U.S. is looking the other way. Uh, as for Palestine, I've been there pretty often. I, I don't know. Uh, I think it, I mean, Israel's for 50 years has been carrying out a illegal, brutal occupation, totally in violation of international law and security council resolutions. Uh, the U.S. has been providing the arms. Uh, if you read the, Isra the Israeli press, or it's the main newspaper, every day there's another crime in the West Bank. Gaza, of course, which I've also visited, is just a miserable prison and a punching bag for Israel. And they feel like it. They do what they call mowing the lawn, just let's bomb and kill a lot of civilians. And, hit the hospitals and so on and so forth. Um, about There's a million children, two million population, about a million children in Gaza. They can't get potable water. The um, Even that, the power stations destroyed, sewage stations destroyed, fishermen can't or aren't allowed to go out more than a couple of kilometers, which means they can't fish because of the pollution. It's just a horror story. But the West Bank, too, is just daily crimes, what they call the settlers, the hilltop youth, the IDF, the armies watching them, Palestinians try to protect themselves, the Palestinians are attacked. It's, uh, it's um, about the only place that resembles it right now, I think, is Kashmir, also occupied by India uh, illegally. Uh, imposed and sending Indian settlers and so on, very much on the Israeli model. So could Israel get away with it without the U.S.? Not at all. In the 1970s, Israel made a fateful decision. It had to choose between expansion and security. It's in the early 70s, the Arab states, uh, Egypt, Syria, Jordan, the three neighboring Arab states were looking for a way to end the conflict. There were resolutions introduced in the Security Council, supported by these three confrontation states, which called for establishment of two states, Israel, Palestine, on the internationally recognized border maybe with some modifications, with, I'm now quoting it, guarantees for the right of each state to exist in peace and security within secure and recognized borders. That would have given some kind of settlement, not beautiful, but better than anything else you can think of. Israel was infuriated, refused to attend the sessions, uh, Yitzhak Rabin, who was UN representative, bitterly condemned the United Nations for daring to move in this direction. U.S. vetoed the resolution. Uh, well, goes on from there. Won't go the details. Israel basically decided at this point it's going to expand even at the expense of security. Now that has a corollary: relying on the United States. You can't do that unless the most powerful state in the world is going to support you. And that's what's happened ever since. The U.S. has been backing it all the way, provides the uh, military support, economic support, uh, diplomatic support, huge flow of vetoes in the Security Council, 
votes at the General Assembly, uh, you know, 150 to two, that sort of thing. And, uh, and it, uh, when Trump came along, he just abandoned any pretense. Israel had annexed the Golan Heights in violation of Security Council orders, annexed what's called Jerusalem, which is in fact five times as big as Jerusalem ever was, including Palestinian villages, also against Security Council orders. Trump simply said, fine, take them, it's yours. Uh, uh, Trump decided to punish the Palestinians by removing the small amount of aid that the U.S. was giving, humanitarian aid, because the Palestinians weren't grateful enough to him for selling them totally down the river. Now that's the Trump administration. Biden's essentially pers continued pretty much with it, softened some of the edges. Uh, that's uh, That's been the what Israel's doing is perfectly plain. It's been obvious for 50 years, constructing a kind of greater Israel, which uh, keeps Gaza in its current state. It uh, um, takes everything that's of value in the West Bank and integrates them into Israel. So take over the Jordan Valley, kick out the population on one or another pretext. It's about a third of the arable land. Uh, imprisons the rest, uh, exp vastly expanded Jerusalem, taking in Palestinian villages, towns to the east like Malo Dumim, uh, Ariel Dumim, each of them basically bisects the livable part of what remains, uh, integrate all of this into uh, subsidized housing and nice suburbs in Malo Dumim. You can live in a subsidized villa there and get to your job in Tel Aviv and Haifa, Jerusalem on a super highway in which you never even see a Palestinian because they're not allowed. Uh, the Palestinian population concentrations are excluded. Israel doesn't want them. It wants to maintain a large Jewish majority in what it can call a democratic state. So Nablus is encircled, but it's not incorporated into what Israel's taking over. And that's basically greater Israel. Palestinians who remain in the territories that Israel's occupying and taking over are cut off into about 160 small enclaves surrounded by Israeli soldiers, which prevent people even from going to their olive groves or pasture their flock. Occasionally they'll let them through, but basically imprisoned, constant attacks by what are called hilltop youth, right wing, mostly religious settlers, many from the United States. Uh, that's life in the West Bank. Gaza's almost unlivable. In fact, the international institutions conclude that Gaza will literally be unlivable in a few years. Uh, Golan Heights, everybody's forgotten about Syrian Golan Heights. And of course, it couldn't be done without strong U.S. support. There's a whole section in the racket on U.S. poverty and inequality at home. Do you think there's a link between the empire abroad and the war on the poor at home in America? I don't think there's a direct connection with imperialism abroad. Uh, these are basically separate matters. The neoliberal programs were designed, as I said, they're basically class war. I mean, officially, if you look up the definition, it talks about markets and small government and so on. That's all nonsense. We've talked about markets, uh, same internal to the United States. When Reagan, it started to build up during the late Carter years. But when Reagan took over and Thatcher in England, it just shot through the roof and spread to the rest of the world. Uh, uh, as far as free markets are concerned, uh, Reagan opened the door to financial speculation. The financial industries grew enormously, make a lot of profit. Of course, there's crashes. The Reagan, the first, the first couple of years of the Reagan administration, I think, 
1984, they became the largest bank bailout in American history. Reagan bailed out the Continental Illinois Bank. Uh, Reagan administration ended with a savings and loan crash. Had to bail out the perpetrators, then one crash after another. Each time the friendly taxpayer moves in and bails them out. And it's not just bailouts. The It's understood there's a phrase, too big to fail, which means no matter what you do, no matter what crimes you commit, taxpayer will bail you out. That means they get cheap credit, high credit ratings, make risky investments, a lot of money, safe, because you'll be bailed out. That's the market uh, internally, externally, we've already discussed. Uh, what about small government? Government's grown, grew, in, but it's grown to support the rich and the corporate sector. They need protection and support. It was a Rand Corporation, quasi-governmental corporation, did a study of transfer of wealth from the lower 90% of the population, working people, middle class, transfer of wealth from them to the top 1% during the neoliberal years, about $50 trillion. That's pretty effective class war. You take a look at the Reagan administration, practically doubled the debt, huge increase in the federal debt because of tax cuts for the rich and enormous military spending. Trump also blew a huge hole in the deficit with his one legislative achievement, 2017 tax cut, for, sharp tax cut for the rich in the corporate sector. The Republicans don't care when they blow up the deficit and the, it's when the Democrats do it that you get what you're seeing right now. But uh, uh, that's uh, real wages have pretty much stagnated male real wages for non-supervisory workers are about what they were in 1979. Of course, productivity has increased, wealth has increased, but going into different pockets. Actually, the Biden years have seen a improvement in the situation of working people. Contrary to what you read in the headlines, for working people, it's been a comparatively good economy, even for the lower paid who are doing better, doesn't make up for the 40, 45 years of destruction of labor, but uh, slight improvement. Uh, Republicans are going to try to break any anything, anything that contributes to that they're opposed to strongly. They've stopped being a parliamentary party a long time ago. They're just in abject service to wealth and corporate power, and, uh, but uh, the, uh, I think the imperial uh, atrocities and the internal domestic repression are not really closely connected. They're just parallel developments. There's something that lies behind them, of course, making sure that the world and the domestic economy are operating to the benefit of the very rich and the corporate sector. That's a commonality. I went to Honduras, a key part of the US so-called war on drugs for the book. Can you describe what the reality of the US war on drugs is? Well, Honduras has been a, it was the, uh, uh, um, an almost a paradigmatic banana state owned by the United Fruit Company, working people miserably repressed, huge profits for the company, small, rich elite called sometimes the 14 families, very rich. They cooperate with foreign imperialist powers and enrich themselves. That's standard. Uh, during the 1980s, Honduras was turned into a, an armed camp. Basically, it was the base for the U.S. attack against Nicaragua. 
which incidentally the U.S. was condemned for at the World Court and told them to get lost, just like it tells the World Trade Organization to get lost. Uh, uh, it continued that way until a couple of years ago, 2008, when a moderately reformist President Mel Zelaya started to begin to reverse the process. He was overthrown in a military coup, kicked out of the country, uh, who was harshly condemned by almost the entire world, one exception, the Obama administration. Obama and Clinton refused to call it a military coup because if they had, by law, they would have had to stop military aid to the junta. So therefore they said it's not a military coup, it's just an internal uh, change of some kind. The military junta ran a totally fraudulent election, also condemned by Latin America and the world, except for Obama and Clinton, Hillary Clinton, who said it's a wonderful step towards democracy and so on. I mean, all of this is so familiar in the history of Latin America, I hesitate even to report it. The junta was introduced, would be introduced a regime of torture, terror. Honduras became maybe the homicide capital of the world. People started fleeing from Honduras. Honduras, the caravans, the famous caravans were based in Honduras. U.S., of course, kicked them out, got Mexico to kick them out, drive them back home. Uh, the drug war is part of it. We might ask what the drug war is. The drug war is in the United States. Demand is in the United States. The arms to, that the military uses, say in Mexico, to attack the cartels, um, or that the cartels themselves use, the arms that the cartel uses to kill tens of thousands of people. They come from where I live in Arizona. I mean, I don't know which end of a gun to hold, but I could walk into a gun store, pick up a rifle, um, hand it over to the local representative of the cartel, and he'd go down to Mexico with it and start killing people. Uh, it's not everything, but it's a lot of it. Uh, the uh, Colombia, which is maybe the Mexico is Horst, or Colombia has been one of the worst cases. Paramilitaries connected to the government uh, carry out major atrocities, all closely connected to the drug cartels. I've, I visited southern Colombia peasant areas. Uh, you go to a remote village, pass a place on the side of the road where there's white crosses people killed by the paramilitaries when they were trying to drive in a, in a bus, you know. Uh, the, there's the program of what's called fumigation, U.S. fumigation, essentially chemical warfare. It's supposed to destroy opium, destroys everything, uh, doesn't discriminate. Uh, you see kids with uh, horrible boils and many die and so on. It's uh, uh, And there's a background to this. Uh, if you go back to the 1970s, before the neoliberal period, take a look at incarceration rates in the United States. They were fairly high, but within the spectrum of Western societies. Now they're five to ten times as high. A lot of that is the effect of the drug war. Why? Has there been more crime? And why is it happening? The drug war took off with Nixon, but Nixon, by contemporary standards, was quite liberal and humane, believe it or not. So if you look at Nixon's drug war, it had a substantial component for prevention and treatment. Now, there have been studies, Rand Corporation, others, of just cost-benefit analysis of modes of dealing with drugs. By far the most effective and least costly is prevention 
and treatment. Next most expensive is police action, more expensive, less, less effective. More expensive than that and still less effective is border control. Worst of all, most expensive, least effective is what are called out of country operations, like supporting paramilitaries in Colombia and, and uh, chemical warfare. You look at policies, virtually the opposite of the recommendations. By now, almost nothing for prevention and treatment, which is the only effective way. And it's a way to control the population here. And it's devastating for Latin America. Uh, but the drug war is centered here. It's see, now you find right wing congressmen saying we have to invade Mexico to stop fentanyl production. How about treating the source of the problem here, not invading Mexico, not sending them guns, not, not uh, fumigating their uh, Colombian territory? It's, uh, it's just another major crime. I also went to Egypt and Tunisia soon after the revolutions there in 2011. Do you find hope in what happened there? There was hope in Tunisia and Egypt. The Arab Spring, so-called, pretty much started in Tunisia. Egypt's the most important country, of course, and it picked up in Egypt. And for the first couple of months, there was real hope that something would change. They could overthrow the dictatorships. The dictator of Tunisia had to flee the country. Uh, the United States supported the Egyptian dictator Mubarak about as long as it was possible to do so. At some point, the army and the business world turned against him, so the U.S. did too. Army took over, instituted the harshest, murderous dictatorship in Egypt's history. Uh, Trump said that Al Sisi, he described the dictator as his favorite dictator, strong U.S. support all the way. Uh, it's uh, I'm, I'm sorry to be so gloomy and harsh, but you want to ask those questions? I don't see any alternative. Tunisia, unfortunately, it did have a moderately progressive democratic government. It's collapsing, in this case, on internal grounds. The elected leaders turned themselves into a autocrat, is breaking down democratic structures, restoring a kind of dictatorship. Freedom. I notice I have another talk in five minutes. I'm going to have to switch over. Okay, thanks so much for joining me, Professor Noam Chomsky.